This is Rogue Heroes, Ruins of Tassos. It is a top-down action RPG with some roguelite-y elements, although I would honestly hesitate to call it a pure roguelite because it's more similar to its probably most obvious inspiration, which would be something like uh, A Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, is actually what it feels most like, just with some modern roguelite elements sort of mixed into it. And the idea is that you are a hero in a small village that is mostly destroyed and in need of rebuilding, and you will be exploring a very Link to the Past feel feeling open world with a lot of classic Zelda feeling elements as in there will only be a certain number of places you can go at once because you will need to beat certain dungeons to get access to certain tools which will let you explore other areas you know you can't cross a certain bridge until you get the grappling hook uh, you can't go to a certain area until you get the bow stuff like that that feels very familiar if you've played a classic Zelda game and the idea is effectively that you'll be exploring these dungeons to destroy the ancient evil and of course to get this currency these gems and the gems are what you'll use to go back to town whether you die or succeed in every run and upgrade your town little by little, adding new shops, new houses for people to move in, and uh, doing side quests for the various villagers that you'll be finding and rescuing to get more cool stuff. And although the four big main dungeons are the sort of main draw of the world, there's also a lot of other stuff to explore here and there. You'll find all sorts of incidental things like small grottos, hidden caves, uh, chests, spots to dig, uh, side dungeons that are small, like the mausoleum area, for instance, and a couple of other things that you can come across, like these statues that have uh, spells on them, because one of the tools you can get is a magic staff that you can use uh, these runes to equip it with different spells for use in, in different places. And all of this adds to that, you know, classic Legend of Zelda world feeling, where everything opens up organically as you go through the game and get more tools, and you just find all sorts of incidental side stuff that you may or may not have actually had to do, but it will help you if you do decide to do it in further dungeons, making things a little bit easier for you, and just opening up the world as you go. Now, the game actually does not have uh, permadeath exactly. You actually don't lose everything when you die, and this is what I mean by it only really has roguelite elements. It's not like a full-on roguelite adventure, because you don't lose much when you die, actually. You keep all the gold and the gems that you found. You keep all of your tools and items and everything else. You don't actually lose any of your currencies or objects when you die, except for the uh, glass tools. You can find glass tools in dungeons and things that are temporary versions of tools that you can get permanent versions of later just to help you through the dungeon. So you may get like a glass bow or a glass grappling hook before you actually make or find the full things. And uh, those you do lose on death, but that's it. And of course you go back to town when you die with all of your stuff intact, and then you use the gems that you obtained from your dungeon delve to upgrade yourself and the actual town, because there is a whole bunch of extensive upgrade trees for all of your stuff. There's upgrades for your health and MP, there's upgrades for your stamina, there's upgrades for your weapons and individual upgrade trees for your tools. There's a ton of different upgrade trees available as you open up more and more places by building your town up and you know inviting more people to it. And there's also some other stuff that you can use the gems for later on, like uh, gambling in the tavern. And there's also a fishing system, so yeah, it definitely opens up as you keep going. And uh, the only real, like, loss that happens is when you go into a dungeon again, you have to pay all of your gems to open it up. So even though you don't lose them on death, you will lose them if you don't spend them and then go back into the dungeon. But it does ask you, it doesn't automatically do it. So you're effectively supposed to spend as many as you can to upgrade yourself and upgrade your town before you start your next dungeon run. And this is also the same for any of the optional side dungeons like the mausoleum that you're seeing in the background right now that you find along the way. You can also, just by exploring the overworld, find these uh, spheres power spheres, usually in out-of-the-way chests that take a little bit of thinking to get to, or in a sort of hidden dig spots once you get the shovel to dig in random places. And these will allow you to keep a certain percentage of the gems that you have on your person at the time. So, of course, as you get farther in the game, the upgrades will get more and more expensive, and you may have, like, several hundred gems left over that just, it's not enough to actually spend on anything. So if you have these spheres, they allow you to keep a certain percentage of that so you don't have to lose it all every time you start a new dungeon run, allowing you to build up more gems faster in the later game. The main four dungeons are actually themed based on the areas of the world that they're in. They're sort of in the four corners, more or less, and uh, they do have to be tackled in order. And uh, they're pretty large. They are randomly generated, but they're generated from handcrafted rooms, so there's a lot of just little clever things around the dungeons. They feel like they're handmade because, well, they technically are. It's just the exact order of the rooms is different each time, which is my preferred method of procedural generation. Instead of having it be completely random, I, I prefer to have a bunch of handmade chunks that are stuck together. 
And uh, that means you find some very Zelda-esque room designs, you know, block pushing puzzles, uh, statue grappling puzzles, uh, switch puzzles and stuff like that, and of course your traditional just rooms full of enemies, and then eventually, as you would expect, a boss at the very end. Uh, the dungeons also have a shortcut system where once you get to the second and third floors of the dungeons, you'll be able to spend some of the gems that you've accrued to open a shortcut to that floor. So if you uh, die and you don't feel like doing like the first floor again, you made it all the way to the third floor, you can just skip there. Uh, but that does depend on your ability to actually kill all the monsters because the monsters, they don't exactly have a level, they have more of like a threat level. There are no levels or experience or anything in this game. Again, true to the Zelda formula, levels don't really exist. But the monsters do have a number above their heads that represents how threatening they are, basically how much health they have and how much damage they'll do when they hit you. It depends on this number above their head. So you're meant to be upgrading yourself, of course, as you go, and further dungeons in the game, as well as deeper floors of those dungeons, will have higher and higher threat level enemies, so you might not necessarily want to skip to the late floors once you've made it there the first time, because you might need to be collecting a whole bunch of gems from the previous floors first to upgrade yourself enough to be able to take on the later floors successfully. So the dungeons are a case of upgrading yourself by run by run and then trying to beat them deeper and deeper until you get to the boss and actually complete the actual dungeon. And uh, the dungeons are laid out in a handcrafted feeling enough way to where you can also get used to the layout of them. Even though it's a little bit different every time, it's not so random as to have like nothing you can get used to or to just to be totally unexpected all the time. You can get used to the various rooms they'll just be put together in a slightly different order. So that allows you to actually get used to each dungeon's overall themes and layouts and possible uh, enemy collections and stuff like that in each room and also the various uh, key puzzles and other puzzles that you'll find in the rooms to actually continue. The game does use a Zelda-like small key system where you'll need to find various small keys from like chests hidden by puzzles or hidden by clearing out rooms of all enemies or, or something of that nature in order to unlock some of the doors on that particular floor of that dungeon. The keys only work there in the way that you would expect. And eventually, of course, on the third floor, you'll have to find the big key, the boss key, that opens the big boss door so that you can actually fight the final boss of that dungeon and complete it. Beating the boss of one of the main dungeons will reward you with a ton of gems to spend, as well as an item that you can only get from beating them. Like, for instance, the first dungeon's boss gives you the grappling hook that opens up extra parts of the world and allows you to get to the swamp area so that you can find the second dungeon and other optional areas once you go exploring around with it. And uh, also, of course, we'll give you a medallion thingy that you will use in the final big dungeon of the game where the big boss lies. You have to get all four of these medallions in order to open up that final area. There are actually quite a large variety of tools, some of which you can find in the world and some of which, as I mentioned, you'll find as the rewards for beating the bosses of the story dungeons, allowing you to progress through the world. But some of them you can also get from uh, this monster research character that you'll find uh, early on in the game and you can build a research area for him in your town and you can uh, find different drops from monsters and then bring them to this dude and he'll unlock some extra tools for you. Things like uh, the bow, for instance, is something that you get from him. And uh, this is kind of an interesting system because there's a bestiary in the game for this reason, to research monsters. And I've, I'm always a fan of bestiaries in games. I think being able to get like official names and descriptions of monsters is fun. Maybe like games like Castlevania sort of spoiled me when it comes to like good bestiaries. But the way that it works in this game is kind of funny because in order to actually record a monster in the bestiary, you have to beat them with it. You have to actually take the physical book and kill a monster with it in order to get their entry in the bestiary. It doesn't do that much damage, although, funnily enough, just like all of the other tools at your disposal, it is actually upgradable, so you can make it do more damage. And to the point where it actually deals quite high damage, it just has a, fer a fairly high attack delay, so you can't spam it. But, yeah, you have to kill things with the book itself to get them in it. And eventually, you'll have to kill a certain number more of that monster, just in any way that you want. Your sword works just fine in order to fill up this gauge. And once the gauge is full, you can kill that same monster again with the book, and it will master that particular entry, showing you their drops and things like that. So, yeah, that's a fun system, and I think it's kind of unique. You rarely see a bestiary that's an actual physical item that you beat monsters with. You also have a house back in the village that can be upgraded in size and decorated in all kinds of ways. And in fact, you can actually go to a furniture sort of general store that you can build later on that allows you to buy all sorts of other furniture and decorations and stuff for your house so you can deck it out however you want you can even customize the wall colors and things there's also a class system you can switch classes back at your house at your wardrobe uh, there are various classes that you can find and unlock you actually have to find threads these like spools of thread each specific type opens up one of the classes and you have to go to the uh a tailor 
at your village and uh, use some gems to unlock these classes once you find their particular threats. And the classes have three different statistics. They have a movement speed, an overall defensive stat, and an attack stat. They usually have some kind of passive effect, like say, you know, one of them is a mage class that can use the uh, magic wand item much more effectively. It does a lot more damage when used by them, and there's also something like a ranger that uses the bow much more effectively, things like that. Uh, there's a witch that has much more effectual potions, and they also all will have some sort of active ability on the B button. Something like a dodge roll or a dash or a blink or something that turns you invisible and allows you to backstab enemies for guaranteed crit damage. There's the Reaper, which is a class that I very much enjoy. It can actually turn into an invincible skull and roll around the place for a little while, helping you avoid damage or go through certain traps and areas and dungeons much more effectively. So when you combine all the different sorts of classes that you can find with their active and passive capabilities and all the various items that you'll be able to get your hands on as you progress through the game, there's actually quite a bit of variety in ways that you can actually tackle each of the individual dungeons and explore the world. I'm really impressed overall with the way the world feels. I very much enjoy the overworld's layout. I think it feels very authentically Zelda-esque, very inspired, clearly. I like the amount of stuff and optional things and secrets and all that, that there is to find in the world, and I like how it opens up very organically as you get more and more different items that allow you to traverse it in various ways. I also like that the dungeons have a good bit of personality. They aren't just uh, randomized layouts of identical square rooms full of enemies. They have a lot more individual personality with the various themes of the overworld locations that they're actually based in, like whether it's a desert or a forest and things like that. And uh, they have a lot more creativity in their layouts with tons of puzzle rooms and keys to find and all that sort of stuff that makes them feel like the devs took a lot of good cues from the Zelda games and giving the dungeons a more personalized feel and not just like a place where you go to fight a bunch. There's more to them than that, which I appreciate. The game is also completely playable in co-op, I think up to four player co-op. I have heard some reports that there are some, some bugs and some inconsistencies related to the multiplayer modes of the game. I can't really comment on any of that because I did the whole thing solo, so I don't, I don't really know how good that is. But uh, do keep that in mind, I suppose, and maybe look up some other reviews or just other videos in general that tell more about the co-op side of things because I can't really comment on something that I didn't play. And I've also heard that some people are having some bugs just with the dungeon layouts of the game, sometimes not generating enough keys or uh, getting stuck in areas and things of that nature. And although I'm not going to say that those bugs don't exist just because I didn't experience them, I can only comment on the bugs that I had. And uh, I only had one of those myself. At one point, the dungeon layout did not generate enough keys and I had to actually exit. But uh, that's so far only happened once and I'm pretty sure I cleared all the rooms so I didn't miss a key, but I'm not 100% certain. So it doesn't seem to be like a massively pervasive issue, but there are apparently some bugs with the generation that might need to be worked out. But overall, I think this is definitely a game that's worth experiencing if you're into top-down adventure games of this sort. I think it does a really good job, and I'm impressed by how intact the Zelda-like inspiration feels, even though they've added some other, like, more modern roguelite elements into it. It doesn't feel like it actually damages the inspiration at all, which is kind of impressive to me, honestly. So, yeah, I think it's definitely worth checking out if you're into games like this. I definitely had a good time with it myself, and uh, if you would like to take a look at it, the links will be in the description below this video to the Steam page for you to go and take a look at it. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.